how do you time, Scott, you talked about timing of surgery, you're not doing these in the middle of the night. Is there a, an impact on soft tissue swelling as to when you do these, uh, a la peel on fractures in the ankle? Do you want to wait for that to resolve, or is it not a big deal in the elbow? Uh, I, don't, I don't think it's that big a deal. It's more, more of the issue of the patient that uh, I don't like putting X fixes on. I don't, I don't like when they come with an X fix on and they really didn't need to go through that effort. There's a danger of nerve injury if you put an X fix on. I do like to, if the patient comes to my ER and they come in and say, you know, midnight, whatever, we'll elevate and we call the Statue of Liberty position. So they're hanging up overnight and with a slightly compressive dressing in a posterior splint so the swelling goes down. We just do it the next day or you know, or, or two days later. But I like to get to within the, within the first week. All right, so we'll start off here. These are some, some cases of mine to try to generate some more discussion. So the first patient is a 73-year-old gentleman who fell off a ladder while trimming his hedge. He's a fairly active gentleman, and he was transferred from another hospital to Mount Sinai with this uh, injury. So uh, Matt, why don't you start us off? Uh, you want to hand me that pointer? So, uh, I mean, it's an AP and a lateral of, a, uh, of an elbow, and, you know, obviously the most... Don't, don't point there. I know, yeah. I'm don't blind me. Relax, boys. <laughs> That's why I'm leaning forward. Okay, look right down here. Um, the most obvious thing you can see is, is right here, lateral column injury. But I will tell you that one of the things that often will happen with these kinds of injuries is if you look over here, it looks like the articular, the slope of the uh, trochlear articulation is a little bit up, which to me often means that you probably have uh, a medial sided injury as well. Now, whether it's hard to know because there is some pre existing disease, like this lipping over here medially, so this could be some reactive bone from arthritis or something like that, but I would bet that this comes across and involves. Um, the medial column as well, whether it comes straight through or just involves the articular segment, and that this is impacted up into the, f the bone of the olecranon fossa. There may, there may be injury up here as well. But this is clearly lateral column injury, and I would tell you there's going to be an articular injury there too. Well, I tried to stump you, but as you're too smart for me, so you're able to see that. Uh, he did come with a CAT scan, and he has a, a, the ability to have a 3D reconstruction. So this, again, demonstrates a little bit of that medial-sided fracture plane with the trochlea. Uh, and as the panel has already said, the CAT scan always makes the pieces look more, um, more extensive and, and sometimes can be confusing. So there's a 72-year-old guy with, with this injury. He's pretty active. Uh, who of you would, would perform an arthroplasty in this person? He's over 70. Okay. Why not? Because he doesn't need it. Okay. It's, it's a <laughs> It's a, I mean, the only thing, to, the only thing to, to kind of be concerned about, too, is that when you disimpact that articular segment, so that what ends up happening is this is a, um, this is more of a, uh, a valgus type injury so that the articular surface gets kind of pushed up. So it's a compression injury on the lateral side which gets your lateral column and then impacts your, your trochlea. You have to disimpact the trochlea to get it oriented appropriately to the long axis. And often you'll have bone loss under that. So you do want an arthroplasty handy in case you do something stupid like you flip it out of the field like the old Tic Tac. But <laughs> This one you can fix. This is a fixable thing. I guess I'm supposed to be Bernie up here, and I would say that uh, you know, 73 is pretty young, you know, and uh, you're going to be out in the out in the uh, the ranch. You right. know, you can't be putting fence posts in with a total elbow, and they will, yeah. and he does. So uh, you right. don't want to do a total elbow. Here. And I would tell you, let activity dictate. To, I mean, obviously the reconstructible versus unreconstructable. But I will tell you that 73 year olds aren't the 73 year olds in your grandma's generation. I mean, they are running around with their hair on fire. So, so, and when these things go bad, I mean, everybody talks about this being a great solution, but I tell my patients it's a pay me now, pay me later kind of discussion. That you will, you will do very well, and what you'll see in the literature is the early term results of total elbow for fracture are good, but as things start to drift out a little bit and people start reporting medium and then long term results, you're going to see failures in this group. And when total elbows go bad, they go bad ugly generally. I mean, there is no easy total elbow revision in my practice. So if you can fix these things, fix it. That's the way to go. 
Just a caveat, if, if you look at the AP here again, I think we all discussed, we recognize this is a complex fracture, but sometimes they look not quite as bad as this, and you're tempted to say, well, I can just take down the lateral side. It's a capitellum fracture, and maybe the trochlea is probably okay, I can put a screw across it. And these are the ones that David Ring would call an apparent capitellum fracture. And you still need, the, the, it can be uh, very surprising if you just take down the lateral side and try and shotgun it open and realize you can't get it fixed that way. <laughs> A couple of things. Um, so um, Matt astutely pointed out this medial side, and I'd just like to add a comment. The importance of this is that if the medial epicondyle is separate from the medial trochlea, that's a situation that specifically merits bringing the plate down around the epicondyle onto the medial face of the trochlea. More importantly, it might be said a different way, the, uh, if you think of the trochlea like a popsicle and the medial epicondyle as, a, as the stick, a popsicle with a stick is a lot easier to handle and keep control of than, than the popsicle without a stick on it. If it's got no stick on it, it melts in your hands. These are the ones where the trochlea is difficult to get fixation of mm -hmm. if you don't have the medial epicondyle attached to it. If you do, it makes it all completely different. So that's a key distinction why that's important to make that distinction. Secondly, it might be that on one side of the elbow you've got really good, fairly undistorted um, bone. Um, compression of the bone was mentioned. Well, if you disimpact it and you've got a space there, you don't really have the ability to compress it and achieve contact with compression. Whereas on the other side, you might actually have uh, the very opposite. On one side, you've got good bone. On the other side, you have bad bone or missing bone. Don't hesitate to cut and osteectomize this piece up here in order to make both sides, both sides fit with the capacity to rigidly compress the pieces together. So I, you guys hit all the important points, and, and so this is what we, we did. Uh, and, and I did try to do this without taking an osteotomy, but uh, as, as everybody has sort of pointed out, it's not so easy. And so we did do our osteotomy, and the, the trochlear piece was a, a free piece, so we used that extended plate to go down around. Um, and and uh, he had a little bit of bone combination in the front and developed a little bit of heterotopic uh, filling there, but overall had a healed fracture. I sometimes will add a little posterior plate if there's comminution in this area just to give myself a little bit of reassurance. Uh, I don't know that there's any real value in, in that uh, over not doing it, but it seemed uh, to sort of fit well and it did give a little bit extra fixation where that comminuted section was and, and uh, we were able to avoid uh, a non-union non issue. Any criticism, guys? All right, you're being nice to me. So let's go to the next one. <laughs> You're being rather stupid to ask for criticism, but... <laughs> okay, I'll criticize. <laughs> so I just, just go back one. All right. Yeah, come on. Yeah, I, 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 just, I just think, that, you know, even though you've done a great job, the patient uh, has got HO, right? Uh, and it's got some little extra bone. Uh, yeah. Well, I was hoping you were going to say something. So. Right? So he's yeah. probably got some limited flexion, even, even though you've done a good job. And that's certainly something we've seen in, in all patients with distal humeral fractures. We've reported that. And we also see it in distal humeral fractures treated with total elbows as well as hemis. So just because you put an implant in doesn't mean you're not going to get this problem. In fact, I think you tend to be more prone to it. You know, if this patient was in their uh, 30s, 40s, we would actually give them Indesid. We can maybe bring that up. Right. But uh, certainly in someone over 70, I don't use Indesid. And uh, so that's why we see it, I think, more commonly in the elderly patient with the distal humeral fracture. Now, he does have a little loss of flexion, but he's yeah. happy with it. He doesn't want to do anything further. And that could always be taken out for a fairly minor intervention if needed. So the next patient is a 64-year-old gentleman came to the ER with a, a, an open injury um, in, in this fracture. Uh, any comments on what you see? Similar, similar situation, I think. So the CAT scan, the resident's got a CAT scan when he came in, and again, it shows sort of a T condylar uh, injury with the articular surface is well preserved. I think we'd all agree, based on the discussion we just had, uh, that we would indicate this for fixation and not any sort of replacement. And so this is his immediate post-operative image, uh, or a few days while he's in the hospital with the splint still on. And then the reason I brought this case up is this is his x-ray at six weeks. So he's uh, started his range of motion, and as he started his range of motion, he's developed a little bit of lucency along his olecranon osteotomy site. So it's th at this point, how does everybody fix their osteotomy? I think you need another plate. One, two, three. Yeah. <laughs> a fourth would do. <laughs> so, you, Scott, you routinely use a plate. 
I, I do, but I, don't, I have no basis in, in data to support that. Now, we routinely use plates and have for about 15 years. Matt? I, I generally don't. I mean, I, I ha I've moved to use more plates since Graham's data came about, but, um, you know, at the end of a long case, it's so much easier, which is probably why these guys put their plates on first. Uh, you know, at the end of a long case, to, to spend time putting another plate on, and I haven't had too much trouble with a, with a tension band. Sean? I use an intermedulary device called an electron compression rod, or O-rod. Um, but I would uh, say to you that um, having designed a plate for the olecranon for the osteotomy, a short plate, um, I came to decide that probably it's better to use a tension band than a plate uh, because of the potential for a, um, if, you, if you know that your own results with tension band are okay, by the way, uh, which I thought mine were reasonably okay, because the plate has the potential to erode through the skin. Even if the wound itself is completely healed, the plate can erode through the skin. If you get that problem, it can run into some further problems. So. Um, my sense is that if you're doing an osteotomy, not a complex olecranon fracture, but an osteotomy, it's better not to have that chunk of metal right underneath the skin. And, um, but I think that in the future we'll use completely contained intramedullary devices for this purpose, I think. I think there's some technical issues about putting a plate on an olecranon osteotomy uh, because you really want to have a, a lower profile plate. Uh, and so, you know, some of the plates that are designed for bad proximal humeral fractures are just way too big and thick for this. And, right. and so I think that's one of the problems people are having with these plates when they use them in some of these compromised skin envelopes. Mike? A comment. If you, can you put it back to the, the initial uh, injury films? Yeah. I want to guess that the wound that he had was posterior in this yeah. guy. Yeah. If you look at the initial injury films, you can see that what happens, I think, is the condyles break off and then the shaft punches out through the skin at the back. So if you look at series of these, about 90% or so have the wound posterior and that's where the defect is in the, in the skin. So if you look at the left hand lateral film, you can see the shaft right there. That's the part that usually comes, comes out. Yep. If you see a hole in the skin, for that piece of bone to make that hole, it means it has to go through the triceps to get there. Right. So often when you do the approach on these, you'll see a, a big hole of varying degrees of size in the triceps as well. We looked at that and we found that if you incorporate that defect into your approach and use some kind of tricep split approach, so you, you debride the, the defect in the triceps in this situation and extend it up and down, for what is a relatively simple geometry fracture, you know, two big pieces in the joint like this, you can actually fix it through a split approach. And we compared those to people at an osteotomy for this kind of thing. The, the people who had the split approach actually did about 10% better, so about 10 or 15 degrees more motion and 10 or 10% 10 better on their male elbow scores. The thinking being that rather than injure, injure the extensor mechanism at another site, i.e. the osteotomy, just do that one, one hole and incorporate that in your approach. Yeah. And that, that may have gotten away from this uh, problem with the osteotomy in this particular individual having the extensor mechanism broken at two sites, so to speak. So if you have an easy pattern like this and you want to try that approach, especially if there's a hole there already for you, then that might be a reasonable thing to do. Plus, you want to pay special attention to that spike of bone, because if there's dirt or clothing or debris, that's where it is, right in that humeral spike there distally. And I've seen that embedded there. You know, when I come back to the revision months later, you can actually see stuff right in that spike. Right. That's Mike. Mike, can I ask you a question? Sure. <laughs> if this was a clean, like, five, six, six millimeter hull, when would you, how, how would you approach that? If there was no clothing, if you didn't see it, if it just looked like a clean wound, what would, what would be your timing? It comes into your ER. When, when would you fix it? What would be your management? Well, it, the timing for local fracture, open fractures in my house was in, almost entirely logistical, not medical. Like, it's, if I can get the guy to the OR that, that, that day, I'll do it because I'm not sure I can get it there the next day, frankly. So what I do logistically and what I'd like to do medically, if it came in at midnight, would I want to tackle this at midnight? No. If I could be confident I'd get the guy in the OR at 8 o'clock the next day without canceling my entire elective list, I'd wait. Do I have that luxury? No. <laughs> so I do what I can, basically. Andy? Hey, just to comment on the tension band, if you'd go back to that uh, post-op slide. So I think if you used stouter pins yeah. longitudinally, at the, the angle's fine. And when you use your tension band wire, if you put twists at both sides, you can really tighten it down better. And that may be why this loosened up a little bit. Yeah, and I was hoping somebody was going to make that point. These wires were smaller than the standard ones I use. Of course, we were missing the size that I wanted, so we had to sacrifice and compromise and probably should have done something different like a plate rather than put a smaller pin in. So 
at this point, we watched it, and he continued to do his motion, and at three months, it's gapped a little further, yeah, it but he has no pain. He has a full, almost a full range of motion. He's missing about 10 or 15 degrees of flexion. He's got almost full extension. He has no tenderness over the osteotomy site, and his skin is healed. He has no signs of infection. So what would everybody do at this point? Sean? Revise it, because that's just temporarily uh, a state of, it's a state of what's called unstable equilibrium, meaning he's fine for the moment, but he won't be sometime shortly in the future. Yeah. Graham? So he has no pain and he's not bothered by it? No. So you're going to operate on an asymptomatic patient? I didn't say what I was doing. Well, that's what Sean did said. I'm yeah. just trying to tweak him. So, uh, have so you ever operate on an asymptomatic patient? Uh, I, I would operate on him if I felt that if it separated at some traumatic event in the future, it would be difficult to salvage it. So it would be kind of different. I, I accept that. You, so yeah, so I, I, I would wait until he had symptoms to do something about it personally. Okay, can you back up one, though? Sure. And then, and then we'll go forward pretty quickly from there. Well, all right. I was trying to get a sense for whether you have progressive loss of bone, which, which I thought he did too. He may not have. I mean, one of the problems with non-unions is while you're sitting there watching them, praying that they're going to heal when they're not going to, you get this attritional loss of bone over time. So that, for me, if he's asymptomatic and I'm watching that x-ray and I'm watching it regularly, maybe every four to six weeks, and, it, and I'm not losing bone, then I'm okay waiting on that. And maybe he has a stable fibrous union and that's the end of the day. But if you, if you start losing bone and you sit too long, you won't have any bone. <laughs> You've pretty much solved your problem because you won't have bone to fix. So you get, you get this uh, attritional loss of bone that's intramedullary so that you don't have anything internally to fix with. So um, just, to, to, just to caution, there are times, it's almost like the asymptomatic rotator cuff tear in a young patient. Sometimes you kind of, even though they don't have symptoms, you talk them into something that you think might be of benefit. So if they're losing bone, even if he's asymptomatic, then I'd do something about it. If it's fairly stable, week to, uh, month to month or quarter to quarter, then I would watch it. That's so, why I was going to operate. <laughs> <laughs> I was looking to support you on that one, Sean. That's why I went back. <laughs> so that's what we decided to do. So he's getting serial x-rays every six weeks, and if it becomes symptomatic or displaces and he starts losing triceps, then we would do it sooner. And he knows, obviously, that this may be an issue for him, and it likely will be down the road. So we're keeping an eye on it for now. Probably won't get HO from all that radiographs. That's right. <laughs> Joaquin? He won't heal either. <laughs> <laughs> seven, the lower ones, those I have problems breaking them when I get them in, so I have stopped using them. Any comments from the panel about using 2.7 screws on the distal fragments? Yeah, they're, uh, they're specific to the set that I designed. They're the very long 2.7 screws. They're there for osteoporotic bone, where you have a lot of fragments and uh, soft bone, and you need to get a lot of screws in to get an architectural arrangement of the screws within the bone when three or four screws, for example, is not going to work. They should not be used in good quality bone. They should not be used in the non-common unit, non-osteopenic bone. And they should not be used in bone where you anticipate that you're going to be taking these out because almost for sure bone will bond to them and they will not come out. So I, I'm just going to skip a case. I, I certainly had problems even with the three, five screws breaking the heads off when I take these plates out. Yeah. So, so they're, they're not too much fun. Right. So you got to be prepared to have metal removal tools, especially if you got to revise this to a total elbow and the screws have to come out. And try to take them out on power because you can strip the screw head very easily with these titanium screws and then you won't be able to get it out either. So. And if you do take them out, have a torque limiter so it won't turn if it's locked into the other screw. Then you move to the other screw and that one will come out. Or write down the order you put them in and take them out the reverse order. So I wanted to get to That's one more case problem. that I think represents some of the discussion we were having about the electron. But George, what, you have a question? Quick question for the, uh, for the panel. What if that was the two-week X-ray? So we go back at two weeks post-surgical, and you see the gapping. Then. Same answer. <laughs> what was? I'd revise it. Yeah, I would revise it at two weeks. That's even more likely to be an unstable situation. Graham. Yeah, I'd probably revise it as soon as the soft tissues look good. I wouldn't necessarily do it at two weeks if I wasn't happy with the wound. I'd tighten the wire and I'd revise it. <laughs> All right, so let's, let, we're going to do this very quickly because we have to, uh, we want to break and, and give plenty of time for people to, uh, to go to the industry uh, booths and, and speak, to, speak to our Whoa. people. So, sorry. So, just 
just quickly uh, just to uh, let you know this is an elbow yeah. discussion <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm doing it and it's coming up as a menu so when I hit the R button. So this is an 82-year-old female who presented to our trauma hospital with this X, these sets of x-rays. She's right-hand dominant. You already saw that she fractured her other wrist. So comments from the panel on, on anything they see here. Sean? Well, she's got a combined olecranon and distal humerus fracture. And the olecranon, I'm sorry, the well, olecranon is a simple fracture, it looks like. The, the distal humerus has a coronal and a sagittal split in it combined. It's, it's um, uh, certainly much like we tend to see with these coronal shear fractures, but it's a distal humerus fracture with the coronal shear component to it. The trochlea might be all one piece. It looks a little bit unusual because it looks dense. It looks sort of whiter than normal. I'm not sure why it looks that way, but uh, if the trochlea may be intact, or, or most of it, the medial part I'm talking about, and certainly the medial column is intact. So if she has essentially two pieces of bone laterally to fix, I would fix that as a distal humerus fracture, as a complex distal humerus fracture, but you don't need a plate on the medial side, and then fix the ulna. If she has a loss of bone stock in the articular segments there, I would uh, replace it. Yeah, so we have a little bit of advanced imaging, and I'll go right to the three-dimensional reconstruction. So this, I think, highlights a lot of the issues that we're facing. Um, so any other comment based on that? I think Sean pointed I'd out most of the stuff. I'd be, I'd be concerned that the capitellum area, is it may actually be unfixable. That, so you'd be, be prepared for either doing a hemi or a, a replacement. So Scott, would you do a hemi in this in an 82-year-old? I would, in 82, I, I would do a total. Dr. Mori would do a total, and so would I. Uh, the real thing you've got to do is find out, you know, what her comorbidities are and what her expectations are, but assuming they're reasonable, you do a total elbow, no question. So that's what we did, and, and so we did do a, a tension band construct around the implant, and this was one of the points that was being made about this particular implant and issues potentially with the olecranon, and you can see it at six months, there's probably a persistent radiolucent gap because it's hard to key that piece in. I did sort of get, you know, take a burr and, and make a little trough in the olecranon to try to get it to seat down. It is technically possible to do this type of thing if you've made an osteotomy, but there is some fiddle to it and you may want to have an implant that allows you to key that in a little better as the panel was talking about. Yeah, this is what Graham was talking about though. When you, right there, so that this piece of bone is got to be here and it's unsupported against the back of this implant. So, so you're really relying on the rigidity of your K-wire against the triceps to keep it from flexing. So that if you can, when this thing is down here, you stuff a piece of bone graft up behind the volar or the dorsal part of the implant and that fragment of bone which buttresses it against that flex. And that'll hopefully prevent that from happening. And then, uh, or, or since this does not um, really permit the uh, prerequisites for a tension band technique to be met very correctly. The other alternative is to put a plate on there. And a couple of things just to know. Number one, in my experience, it's, it's always been possible to put a plate and all the screws that you want alongside an ulnar component of a total elbow arthroplasty. There's always room because of the triangular shape of the bone to get screws beside the components. So you shouldn't hesitate to use a plate if you think that's necessary. Um, in this particular case, if, if I decide to do a total elbow, I'm quite sure I would have plated that. I, I think a key point, though, is if you use a plate, don't use a short one. I think it should wrap around the olecranon tip, uh, and I wouldn't use the one that just sits on the back personally because I think you need to uh, uh, screw up the pipe to hold these uh, securely. All right, great. Well, if there's no further questions, we'll take our break. Thank you very much, gentlemen, and uh, please take a chance to meet the, the sponsors out front.